in the last lecture we had talked about multilingualities and uh, three paradigms of hybridities were presented before you. I want to develop this discussion further, especially in terms of hybridities and the three paradigms that we presented before you. One of the key issues there was the issue of English and translations. I want to sort of widen the discussion a bit because actually the issue of translation and I think I had briefly referred to it last time also. This is an issue which is equally applicable to writing or you can say creative writing in any Indian language because of our plural context. And therefore, when I began to think about this some more, immediately in my consciousness a story that I had actually read as a you know college going student, it surfaced in my consciousness. And this is a story by Chandradhar Sharma Guleri and the title of the story is uh, Usne Kaha Tha. There is this remarkable sense of you know mixture of languages and uh, a, a, mil, a, a sort of certain milieu where people speak different languages but they interact with each other very actively. In the story title Usne Kaha Tha, I remember vividly that when the soldier uh, Lehna Singh, he thinks about the best moments of his life as he is dying on the battlefront, he remembers meeting this young girl in Amritsar, 1890s of Amritsar, where every time he met this young girl in the marketplace, he asked her, Teri kurmai ho gai? And I remember as a reader of that text, I am Hindi speaking, I've, I didn't know what that phrase meant. And it sort of estranged me and at the same time, it woke me up to a description of another town, another place, time, different characters and their beautiful subtle sensibility, their desire, their yearning for love. And suddenly this phrase, it sort of animated the whole text in a very different way because the language was not fully accessible to me. And therefore, as I said, this question of translated texts or a mixture of various languages, this issue of hybridity or code mixing is equally applicable to any kind of language or any kind of writing, especially in the Indian context. Because even if you are writing in Hindi or Marathi, Tamil or Telugu, it sort of also brings you close to the way people live. And therefore, I want to place this idea before you that when we talk about multilinguality, plurality or writing, we really are not thinking only about the English language, although we have conducted this discussion or we are conducting this discussion in English. But what we have to say about these ideas or attitudes and also the creative work that comes out of it, this is equally applicable to all our languages. So this to me was a really very important thought and actually in the slide that I showed you, I have referred to Uski Roti by Mohan Rakesh, another short story that is steeped in the Punjabi uh, countryside and the character, uh, the main character is a bus driver and this is about his wife who brings him his roti which means his food actually every day. The manner in which Hindi is constructed in this short story is also very, very evocative of the Punjabi countryside and the sensibility of the Punjabi characters. Maybe you can dip into it and explore this story and the film in order to understand how there are these beautiful subtle blends that have grown in realistic writing in India. And also it will perhaps make you realize that there is something to Ijaz Ahmed's statement when he says that the, you know, that English in itself cannot bridge the cultural gap between the original 
Indian language and the translated text. Whereas I think when a writer writes about the Indian milieu and he's dipping into or she's dipping into the Indian ethos, the transition from one Indian language to another Indian language is easier. So, this is a point of view and an experience that you can also consider before deciding whether you want to write in English, Hindi or your mother tongue. Uh, this is an important question. Now, this other viewpoint, although on the one hand that Ijaz Ahmed had said that there is this cultural gap between the original and the translated text so far as translations into English are concerned, although he also acknowledges English as a very big archival resource from that, that point of view. The other point of view about this comes from Rishdi and we have already talked about it, so I won't repeat it. But what seems interesting to me is the fact that actually everything said and done, our relationship with English is not an easy one. Even if we agree and we know historically that English has more or less become an Indian language and Rishdi in a recent Paris Review interview edition that he has edited, he talked about the malleability of English and indeed through his creative work he has shown how English can be used to convey the vitality of the Indian context. So, in other words, uh, I think his claims and his ideas are very important because on the one hand we have an uneasy relationship with English. Uh, he may not have an uneasy relationship with English, but I think uh, a large majority of us have an uneasy relationship because on the one hand, if the language is considered as a vehicle of modernity and na nation building and we see that all the national discourse in India has emerged out of English. Even if we uh, agree with that uh, sort of perception, the fact remains that it has also become the language of social, academic and economic mobility. So, in some ways it does threaten the Indian languages. I think if we simplify this issue too much, we do not understand or we cannot understand the fissures that are opened between our own languages and English and these are fissures that actually push us in creative directions. So, I would say that uh, the other viewpoint that has been articulated regarding this language issue and about the significance of English in India as a vehicle of modernity, the other point of view has been articulated by Amit Chaudhary who feels that actually it is the rise of the vernacular which became a vehicle for a new secular nationalist consciousness. My other take on this issue about languages, about using English as an Indian language is again a question about the fact that whether we talk about English or we talk about the vernacular and the nationalist discourse, we have to remember that there always have been languages on the margins that were not part of this discourse. I think gradually the scene is changing, but I would like you to keep that in mind. So, the question of how to expand one's vision or understanding to accommodate such a vast variety of issues, that is something that actually needs a lot of uh, you know self assessment and introspection and that is where the creativity can start to bubble. So, our emphasis in all this you know discussion is the growth or de development of investigative and inclusive approach for creativity. If one sort of remains engaged with the world at large, then I think the sense of isolation when one begins to probe one's own identity and one's own desire for self-expression, 
that will actually find greater depth and space within oneself. So, that seems to be an intuitive and also in some ways you can say a combination of intuitive and objective uh, aspects of uh, our understanding and we hope you will be able to judge whether it indeed works for you or not. So, what we are again suggesting is to observe experience events and your context with eyes unclouded. Expand your awareness of as many Indian languages and issues as possible. From this we want to shift our attention to Indian writing in English and also the experimental use of English in novels in particular. The reason we have actually singled out novels is related to the very, very special aspect of this genre. Many scholars, uh, many, many of them and I think uh, Kundera talks about some writers also who hold the opinion that the novel does not really have roots in Indian tradition. I think Kundera also uh, pointed out and maybe I will talk about Milan Kundera later on, but right now I will concentrate on this point of view uh, that he mentions I think in Testament Betrayed, in which he says that now there is almost a transnational history of uh, novel and that it has grown uh, very vigorously in non-Western or non-European countries, that was his point of view. And he makes a remark which I want to place before you because when we begin to dip into writing, we are dipping into various genres with this assumption that whether you want to be an essayist or you want to be an academician or you want to be a creative writer, reading of this enriched work is extremely important. So, we are not really looking at just a particular kind of result in terms of your creative endeavors when we introduce you to these experiments. I want you to keep that in mind because I, in the first module I have tried very, very clearly to release possibilities for different kinds of students who want to pr uh, pursue creativity in any vocation, any field. So, from that point of view, the novel form, it is sort of according to Kundera, it is a response to new historical situations with their new existential content. In other words, it sort of gives you space, gives the writer the space to look at things that maybe are not addressed in our analytical or our political or our social discourses. So, it is a very, very different kind of cultural space and it is also a space where I suppose there is maximum amount of freedom for one's imagination although from Rishdi's case we know that that freedom can also be curtailed at any point in time due to political uh, forces. So, it is not really a simple realm of absolute freedom but certainly it is a very different kind of space. So, now in terms of Indian writing in English, uh, I would like to go back to the first page of Rishdi's Midnight's Children uh, which we had read and I do want to also share this second idea that this exploration of Indian reality in a plural setup it also redefines, it is a way of redefining one's cultural identity. Now, going back to that particular first page and you know I am fully aware of the complexities that a text like Midnight's Children demands, but in this early stage of our discussion, I have stayed with that first page. And the choice of the first page in which Salim Sinai's birth and how deeply it was intertwined with the birth of modern India that is placed before us right from 
as I said, page one, line one. This actually choice was determined by the Paris Review interview that Rishdi gave. And this Paris Review interview series we recommend to anybody who is interested in writers, important and great writers of our time. In this interview, uh, the interviewer was able to sort of pose questions that actually elicited some really fine responses from Rishdi. For us who want to learn to write or for you who is who wants to see these models or you know seek sources of inspiration, some tips from writers, I think there is much that one can learn from this particular uh, interview. And I will just read the response selectively. So, what I am trying to do is to one point out why we chose that first page, tell you a little bit about one's own response to the language mixture that plays out on that page and also then see what one can learn about writing from it. So, the first thing that he says in response to the interviewer's question about his own early writing and I would just come to the Midnight's Children. Before that, he, he said I have three books that I have discarded more or less uh, and I will read this now. Until I started writing Midnight's Children, which would probably have been late 75, early 76, there was this period of flailing about. It was more than a technical problem and I want you to pay attention to the rest of the statement. Until you know who you are, you cannot write. Because my life had been jumbled up between India and England and Pakistan, I really did not have a good handle on myself. This is what he said uh, and then he went on to point out that you know, one day after many years of struggle, he actually suddenly uh, uh, sat down and started uh, writing uh, by discarding the third person narration which was not working for him. And I think I have the quote here for you. So, if the copyright uh, permissions are taken, we will place the quote before you. Otherwise, you can look at this selective reading of, you know, you can hear the selective reading that I have to offer today. So, he said that uh, third person narration, which is what he was trying out, it did not really work for him. So, he says, I decided to try a first person narrative and there was a day when I sat down and I wrote more or less exactly what is now the first page of Midnight's Children. It just arrived, this voice of Salim's, quite savvy, full of all kinds of arcana, funny, but sort of ridiculous. I was electrified by what was coming out of my typewriter. It was one of those moments when you believe that the writing comes through you rather than from you. So, actually, you know, this again seemed extremely important, very interesting and also it takes us back to an, another quotation we had shared with you earlier, where it was pointed out that if the mind is ready, I think it was from Louis Pasteur, that if the mind is ready, which means one is working on that idea with great deal of conviction, great deal of passion and commitment, then there is a kind of a sense of release possible. You never know which way experimental work will take you. So, success is not guaranteed, but the process in itself is so exciting and it is this process that I want you to begin to understand and explore because the end result will depend on many, many factors including the kind of passion or conviction or capability that you have. But certainly, the process will remain very, very rich and it will be very 
exciting for you. So now, uh, this particular statement that I read and the interview that uh, you should read later on on your own, I want to share my own response to the first page. Uh, as I was reading the first page, I, I, I actually would just come to the last two or three, last sentence, almost last but one sentence. Because as I was reading it, the flavor of Hindustani words in English, uh, it just sort of broke through, you know, the flavor, the subtext, it broke through in multiple ways. The statement or the sentence that I am referring to reads like this. I, Salim Sinai, later variously called snot nose, stain face, baldy, sniffer, Buddha and even piece of the moon. Uh, this kind of uh, suddenly evoked very amused, amusing responses because these are words that are used in a very teasing manner, you know, to tease somebody. Uh, with a mixture of affection and ridicule and it sort of evoked the, the subtext, the cultural text and in that sense uh, what Ijaz Ahmed has to say about the cultural gap between English and the Indian context. I think instead of actually taking away from the English text, for me uh, a sort of it really worked very well. It estranged me, amused me, brought, uh, brought forth my own uh, references, frame of references. And I think in terms of other words, they are not really very polite words when you translate them in Hindi, so I will not really try the translation. But the last phrase, piece of the moon, Chan Katukra, I am sure it is accessible to all of you through films that you see and the metaphor uh, of similar kind that is evoked time and again. So, in other words, uh, I found this very exciting and although it does estrange you, but what you do with that fissure creatively, that is also a very important challenge that one can place before oneself. Now, this pro process where language, two languages are intermixed as I indicated to you earlier. This is described as code mixing and hy hybridization is a subcategory of code mixing. I am actually uh, using many, many ideas that have been explained very lucidly by Neelam Srivastava in a paper titled Languages of the Nation in Salman, uh, in Rishdi and Seth. The full title of this essay and the you know resources or the journal in which this article is published, this has been shared with you towards the end of this lecture when we give you the reading list. So, the many of these uh, insights have been taken from Neelam Srivastava's article, but basically we are interested in showing the possibilities of code mixing and some of the other ways of looking at this is through the theory of Bakhtin, which I will not go into because many, many theoretical insights that impinge on our analysis, it is really not possible to explain each one of these, but at the same time if it is possible later on, I will weave that discussion, expand that discussion in the other modules. So, this uh, theoretical concept is related to the dialogic interrelationship of different registers and dialects in uh, which gravitate within the orbit of a national language. That is a statement from Bakhtin. So, what that means is again the interplay of various languages. So, there is no formula for it. it, it shows the life of the people. But what again I am trying to argue for is to allow yourself the possibility of watching more, watching the complex uh, interplay of languages, ideas and also cultural differences. So, now there is uh, I think need to turn towards another example of similar kind of writing in English, 
where the Indian ethos is evoked and evoked quite powerfully, but at the same time the methodology is different. The title heteroglottic or the was used, the concept of heteroglossia from Bakhtin was used for Rishti because he tries to keep the multiplicity alive and he actually does not remain aloof in terms of the language. He is invested in creating the charge of that language, the moments of history, the existential issues of history that he wants to evoke. And therefore, his kind of writing is slightly different from the kind of writing that Vikram Seth has undertaken in Suitable Boy. Uh, we are talking only about Midnight's Children and Suitable Boy. It is not possible to talk about the complete works of both because there is such a lot of variety and we would need a full course to handle those kinds of details. But this instead of translating the differences in a predictable manner, as I said, Rishdi has retained the sense of multiplicity, plurality and he's played around it uh, with this uh, to the great joy of the readers. In a uh, suitable boy, there is an omniscient third person narrator and the multilingual reality is captured in monologic form. And as I said, some of these ideas have been taken from Neelam Srivastava's article essay because she speaks about these issues with great clarity and we have been looking for material that you can relate to and understand without excessive difficulty. So, according to her again, you know, she has pointed out that the code mixing in Suitable Boy, it occurs in, in terms of English and other Indian languages such as Hindi, Urdu, Bengali and the rustic dialect spoken in Debaria. I will try and present a reading of Suitable Boy, an excerpt from Suitable Boy in English and its Hindi translation because seemingly Vikram Seth likes the Hindi translation because he feels that the particular translation that he had in mind had captured the sense of the people, the sense of that language exactly in the way he wanted to recreate and represent in a suitable boy. Today I am going to read out to you an extract from Vikram Seth's novel A Suitable Boy and its subsequent translation in Hindi by Gopal Gandhi. B Vikram Seth being from India and though he chose to write in English, seeing the translation has very interesting ramifications. Vikram Seth himself is known to be quoted that this translation has actually conveyed what he meant to say eh, quite more effectively than he could have, he would have had he written in Hindi. So here is the extract in English. 19.7 Jagatram reacted to Harish's wedding invitation with visible shock. Not so much because Harish was getting married and in Brahmapur at that, but because he should have thought of inviting him. Moved as he was, he had to refuse. The two worlds did not mix. He knew it. It was a fact of life. That a jata from Ravi Daspur should be present at a guest at a wedding at the house of Dr. Kishan Chand Seth would cause social distress that he did not want to be at the centre of. It would injure his dignity. Apart from the practical problems of what to wear and what to give, he knew that he would feel no joy and only intense awkwardness at being present on the occasion. Harish, reading his mind only partially, said with brusque tact, You are not to bring a gift. I have never been a believer of gifted weddings, but you must come. We are colleagues. I won't hear if you are not coming. And the invitation is also for your wife, if she so wishes to come. It is only with the greatest reluctance that Jagatram agreed. The red and gold invitation, meanwhile, was being passed on, on hand to hand between the boys of the family. Haven't they left anything for your daughter? asked Harish, as the last of the bananas disappeared. Oh, her dust has been washed away, said Jagatram quietly. What? asked Harish, shocked. Jagatram shook his head. What I meant to say, he began to say, but his voice was choked. What happened for heaven's sake? She got an infection. My wife said it was serious, but I thought children get a high fever so quickly and it comes down just as quickly. And so I delayed. 
it was the money too. The doctors here are, well, high-handed to us. Your poor wife, my wife said nothing. She said nothing against me. What she thinks, I do not know. After a pause, he quoted two lines. Don't break the thread of love, Rahim has, had said. What breaks won't join. If joined, it knots the thread. When Harish commiserated, Jagatra merely sucked in his breath through his teeth and shook his head again. Now I'm going to read out the text in the translation. Unnish Dasham Lav Saat Nyote se Jagatram ko achambha hua. Is baat par nahi ki Harish bia kar raha hai. Balki is baat par ki usse shadi mein bulaya ja raha hai. Par kritagya aur dravit hote hoye bhi Jagatram ne maafi maangi. Yeh dono dunia hai alag hai usne samjhaya. इन्हें अलग ही रहने देना बेहतर होगा डॉक्टर किशनचंद सेठ के ब्रह्मपुर वाले बंगले में रविदेश रविदासपुर का कोई जाटव आए यह नहीं हो सकता वहां सभी को तकलीफ होगी रहने दें उनकी तकलीफ से मुझे भी तकलीफ होगी रहने ही दें यही सब जगत राम ने कहा पर जो उसने कहा नहीं वो यह था कि पहन के क्या आऊं यह समस्या है और क्या लेके आऊं यह उससे भी बड़ी समस्या है हरेश की शादी में जानने का सारा आनंद यही समस्याएं हड़प जाएंगी हरेश बोला देखिए तोहफा तो नहीं लाना है मैं खुद तोहफों को नहीं मानता पर आपको आना होगा हम साथ काम करते हैं आपके न आने का तो सवाल ही नहीं है और न्योता आप दोनों के लिए है अगर आपकी पत्नी भी आ सके बहुत सोच विचार कर आखिर में जगत राम ने कहा ठीक है आऊंगा लाल सुनहरा कार्ड इस बीच हाथों हाथ जगत राम परिवार के लड़कों में घूम रहा था केले खत्म हुए जानकर हरीश ने पूछा बच्ची को केला नहीं दिया जगत राम ने शांत स्वभाव से कहा वह उसकी मिट्टी मिट्टी में समा गई है क्या हरीश ने स्तंभित होकर पूछा जगत राम ने सिर हिलाकर कहा बीमारी लगी थी बुखार चढ़ गया था घरवाली ने कहा मामूली बुखार नहीं है मैंने कहा बच्चों को बुखार चढ़ता उतरता रहता है कुछ नहीं है देर कर दी पैसों की भी बात थी डॉक्टर यहाँ हमसे ज्यादती करते हैं आपकी पत्नी बेचारी उसने कुछ नहीं कहा मुझसे कुछ नहीं कहती सोचती क्या है वही जाने फिर दार्शनिक भाव से बोले रहीमन धागा प्रेम का मत तोड़ो चटका आए टूटे से फिर ना जुड़े जुड़े गांठ पड़ जाए हरेश ने संवेदना में कुछ शब्द कहे जगत राम ने ठंडी सांस भरकर सिर्फ सिर हिलाया द अदर एग्जाम्पल विच आई वॉन्ट टू प्लेस बिफोर यू एंड रिमेंबर इन द लास्ट लेक्चर वी टॉक अबाउट द सबोल्टन पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू ऑन द वन हैंड and the outlook of globalization on the other hand and if you notice in terms of my titles to the talk i have tried to highlight it for example if we go back to the title of rishdi's segment i have given the title conversation with the world you know we, this is from his editorial comment to the vintage book in which he actually tries to promote the idea and i think this idea comes from his uh, placement or his space in the indian diaspora but he sort of argues for a global outlook uh, an outlook uh, where uh, writing indian writing uh, actually is a mode of conversation with the world and in terms of his notion of the world it is the international setup in addition to our own indian setup uh, so as a contrast you will notice that both the writers are very important but mahashweta devi she wants to talk to the tribals and the oppressed that is her world so to say and in terms of her creative process and as i said all the writers that we are talking about are deeply engaged with every facet of reality they are the kind of people who are very open minded and they have been very investigative in their approach for example if you want to understand about different kind of writers i think imaginary home lines of uh, rashti by written by rashti is an excellent example of how deeply he has tried to understand 
different kinds of writers and their location in their own historical context and how their uh, writing has emerged as a dialogue with the world at large. Now, in terms of Mahashweta Devi, uh, this is a, a very different kind of uh, outlook and a very, very important one for reasons that you will understand yourself. But she wants to talk to the tribals and the oppressed. She is not thinking of any other audience, although her initial writing was published in Bengali literary uh, magazines, so to say. So, it is not as if she has given up on other kinds of readers, but her conscience and her soul is stirred by the condition of the tribals, their beauty also. And therefore, the, let us see what she has to say by way of the creative process. In the interview to Samik Bandopadhyay, which we have listed that book, uh, I think the this is an editorial uh, kind of uh, comment that he has written or uh, and he has also quoted this interview. This is uh, her five plays. So, in that she says to him, a responsible writer standing at a turning point in history has to take a stand in defense of the exploited. Otherwise, history would never forgive him. So, there is that this sense of responsibility towards history, towards people to stand up in defense of the exploited. The particular interview that I have mentioned, it is as I said, uh, this is an editorial interview uh, and also uh, it refers to her plays. Now, Mashweta Devi actually started writing uh, novels and short stories and then she wrote plays at the behest of Samik Bandopadhyay. But she uh, sort of continued to keep some kind of a hold on her uh, well, investigative approach and I keep using that word because in terms of middle class writing of Mahashweta Devi also, uh, you know she wrote about areas of conflict where the middle class was in direct confrontation with the subaltern. And in the plays that she wrote, she picked up stories where this confrontation was brought, brought out and also the failures of our systems, our political systems were brought out, but at the, in such a way that the voice of the exploited remain very, very authentic. It was not you know reduced to a particular stereotype or a caricature. So, the same desire impelled her towards not only translating some of those short stories or adapting them in a naturalistic framework, but at the same time she began to explore traditional folk forms like the alkap with its rich treatment of social themes in an idiom of repartees. Now, the genre that I am referring to therefore, uh, is different here. I am referring to her plays, although she is not known as a great you know playwright, but at the same time I am referring to her plays, because in some ways she shifted to writing of plays and also searching for this uh, model of public participation, because short story writing and novel writing did of course offer her cultural and public space, but it was very different and she felt that this kind of engagement, uh, public engagement or community oriented engagement that she wanted, uh, th this form was very participatory and important. We will go into this in other modules again, but I think uh, I do want you to be aware of the change of form and how each literary form offers a very different kind of possibility while we are exploring writing and it you much will depend on what you want to say, who you want to say something to etcetera. So, she sort of began to explore uh, many of these uh, folk forms. So, they were already there because oral for a kind of thinking and writing orality is very strong in many, many tribal groups. So, and also in other cultures. So, then the code mixing that is present in Mahashweta Devi. So, again in terms of code mixing, I bring back this whole issue of 
code mixing within Indian languages and that is why I had shared the example of Usne Kaha Tha and here again we find that the code mixing that is available in uh, Mahashweta Devi is a combination of Bengali and the dialects of the tribals depending on which uh, particular text we are talking about. We will perhaps dip into water, but let us also see what she has to say about why she dipped into this material because she feels that she wants to use the folk imagination through its legends, mythical figures, mythical happenings, but she places them in a contemporary setting. I think all of this is very visible in water, her play where Maghai Dome is the protagonist and he is a traditional water diviner. We cannot go into the details again, but she has placed Maghai, uh, the traditional water diviner in the framework of contemporary needs and aspirations of the domes of that community, you know he belongs to the dome community. And the fact that they are exploited by the landlord uh, of that particular village. Uh, by asking Magai Dome to divine water, but he does not allow them to use that water. So, there, there is a very contemporary problem that she has placed uh, in the play and she has explored how to balance this deep indigenous source of knowledge that Magai Dome uh, represents and the modern possibilities uh, of, you know, interventionist modern possibilities that actually need to respect this indigenous base of knowledge and at the same time offer democratic contemporary solutions to the existence of marginalized communities. So, this third uh, paradigm again of uh, you know the code mixing in the Indian language brings us back to Ijaz Ahmed's contention that and I think here there is it you know it is relevant because the kind of uh, nuances that Mahashweta Devi brings to her original text, I think that is not accessible in the English translation. Now, whether it is the limitation of the translator or it is the limitation of this process or whether you need strategic translation and not just straight translations of a certain kind, all this actually needs to be examined. My name is uh, Jim Matthew Kochiti and I will be reading Makhai Dome's dialogue from Mahashweta Devi's Water. When the King Bhagirath brought the when the King Bhagirath brought the holy Ganga down from the heavens, Basumati, the Mother Earth, asked Ganga, Give me a little bit of it, sister, to keep hidden in my bowels. Ganga told Basmati, hold the nether Ganga in your bowels. So, the nether Ganga flowed into the secret depths of the Mother Earth. My earliest ancestor had come all prepared to offer puja to the holy river at her advent. But by the time he arrived, Bhagirath had already left with Ganga. So, he stuffed himself up with booze, gathered all that he had brought with him to offer to the holy river and offered puja to the nether Ganga. Once he closed his eyes to do obeisance, the drunken stupor took over and he fell asleep. When he opened his eyes, there was no sign any longer of Ganga. It was emptiness all around. He was just a dome after all, and naive, and so easily fooled. So he thought, I must have dreamt it all. Then, from the bowels of the earth, the nether Ganga herself, the mother deity of all the hidden waters spoke, You are my chosen priest, I am the goddess, the nether Ganga. Whenever men dig for a well or a pond, you will gather the offerings, pray for water, and go around looking for where the water lies hidden, till I tell you where to dig. And ever since, that has been our work. How can we charge for water? It is forbidden. And that is why we are fated to go hungry. 